I see people are still trickling in, but I think uh, let's get started on time. Um, good evening to all of you. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Suman Chakravarti. I have known him for many years. I'm Navkan Bhatt, by the way. I'm, uh, I see that there are people from outside here. So I'm Navkan Bhatt, a faculty in IASC. So let me first uh, briefly introduce Suman Chakravarti. Uh, today he is presenting uh, Infosys Prize Lecture uh, titled Engineering Human Blood Vessels, Fact or Fiction? The Infosys Prize is given by the Infosys Science Foundation in six categories of science and engineering research. The Infosys Prize Lecture Series, which Suman is presenting today, are talks given by the winners and jurors of the prize. These talks are aimed at making their work accessible to a wider audience from across academia as well as informed public. Professor Suman Chakravarti was awarded the Infosys Prize 2022 in Engineering and Computer Science. Suman is Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and also the Dean of R&D at IIT Kharagpur. He was awarded the Infosys Prize in 2022 in Engineering and Computer Science for his pioneering work in elucidating the interaction of fluid mechanics, interfacial phenomena, and electromechanics at the micro and nano scale. Using this understanding, he has helped to advance healthcare, particularly in resource limited settings, through the invention of novel low cost medical devices for sensing, diagnostics, and therapeutics. With that, uh, over to you, Suman. Thanks, uh, Professor Bhatt, and uh, it is indeed a great honor uh, for many reasons. Uh, one is, of course, a great honor uh, of being bestowed with the very prestigious Infosys Prize, uh, which I have seen you know, many of the very accomplished uh, you know, researchers winning that, including Professor Bhatt himself. Uh, having said that, you know, there are several more issues. Uh, I have been a student here and uh, whatever is the ABCD of research that you know, I have learned from here. And uh, it is therefore a great honor uh, to get the opportunity of presenting some of my work at a place where I find people from my own supervisor to my own students who have become faculty members all around. And uh, you know, therefore, uh, I would say it's a matter of great honor, pride, and privilege. So uh, I will start uh, with a bit of like what I am going to talk about before entering into the topic. And uh, as I appreciate and realize that the objective of uh, talk of this type is to maybe have a dissemination of the related research to an audience who may not be really familiar with uh, you know, the kind of topic. And what helps me is that I am also not quite familiar with most part of this topic. And uh, you know, that is uh, what I say is a blessing in disguise. And uh, perhaps this is what interdisciplinary research is all about. where. Uh, it's a lifelong learning and we keep on learning and what I will share is what I have learned so far in, on this topic from the perspective of an engineer, not really from the perspective of a biologist. So uh, if uh, I start with the perspective of an engineer and you know, being an uh, engineering student, I would prefer to start from something 
which at least in our domain of engineering is considered to be a bread and butter subject fluid mechanics so anybody who has uh, studied mechanical engineering chemical engineering aerospace civil engineering and so many other related disciplines at the undergraduate level will go through this subject and uh, as a student and maybe as a teacher for you know teaching this subject for now more than 20 years there was a point of time when i started believing that perhaps i you know know all these things quite well at least what i am talking to my students in a second year third year undergraduate class in engineering one of the very very common topics that we talk about is fluid flow through pipes like in in fluid mechanics if someone has not solved a uh, few problems on a pipe flow chapter i do not think that person has passed at least an undergraduate fluid mechanics course now if you look into this uh, you know this is a like taken from the internet uh, some you know engineering plant and you can see that complex piping networks are here and this is something what uh, we would imagine from an engineering view point is perhaps the most complex problem that we may be asked to solve well you know still i do not know how to solve this piping problem but given you know the tools at least uh, i believe that there are people who are masters in solving this now when i came to the realm of uh, starting to understand at least making an attempt to understand what kind of fluid mechanics goes in human physiology i realized that maybe my knowledge is almost close to zero the reason and i will talk about that reason and how like uh, you know sort of cracking the puzzle one after the other we could advance from there is something that i would talk about but broadly if you see you know what is there as a pipe in the human body there is no such unique type of pipe you have different blood vessels and the blood vessels are all of different characteristics in terms of their dimension and the flow what is taking place so you have large arteries large veins and these are uh, you know typically say the largest artery for example will have about say 2.5 cm of its uh, effective inner core diameter so it is quite large and uh, large from a human body perspective now you also have small arteries small veins you have arterioles and venules these are you know smaller and smaller ones and finally what is connecting the arterioles and venules are very uh complex capillary networks which are called as micro capillaries which you know for a person like me who works in the domain of microfluidics we i can call it micro channel in human body just to make it a bit engineering oriented so to say now these micro channels in human body are <coughs> of course very very typical and we will see why they are typical how they are different from even what micro channels we talk about in engineering and today my entire talk will be to see how we can bridge the gap between micro channels in engineering and micro channels in human body through whatever experimental uh, computational or you know several other possibilities now i am also touching upon one particular point you know i will talk about a few uh, very unique aspects of this particular uh, fluid flow or in particular blood flow for example but one very unique thing is that uh, in human body we get all sorts of you know complexities but the complexity is compounded by a fact that sometimes the blood vessels that we are talking about are extremely dynamic in nature all what it means now is that let us say we have a structure of this tiny capillary networks within our body maybe after a few days the structure is completely different because the blood vessels are dynamically adapting and it happens for people who are suffering from progressive cancer and a phenomenon which occurs is known as angiogenesis that means new blood vessels are created 
and these new blood vessels are created with a certain mechanism with a certain uh, purpose and i will come to that but what i am telling is that this is perhaps the complexity at its best where even if you are imagining that you have a very complex piping system what you are imagining is only at that point of time you really do not know maybe for a cancer patient what will happen to that after a few days so the issue is that well we we all consider it to be uh, like a very modern subject but uh, not that i am going to talk here about uh, the detailed history of science or something like that but this is a subject which has its uh, sort of history in a way that it has uh, prompted us to learn certain things from the way in the in which the subject got evolved uh, one of the pioneering uh, what we call as you know a genius in the renaissance era leonardo da vinci uh, we we it is very difficult to you know call him as a scientist painter artist whatever you know it is very difficult to define and that is what he was at the end uh, very difficult to define but uh, through some of his paintings he was perhaps one of the early uh, personalities to talk about many of these blood vessels not really theoretically but with a lot of insight and one of the great inspirations that actually could make it possible is because you know he was a great visionary and he was also a great painter he could paint nicely what happens uh, you know how a uh, river flows for example uh, and with his unique imagination he could connect how rivers are flowing with how you know blood is flowing in the blood vessel this is something what only a creator and an imaginative person will have but you know science is not just that one also has to get deep into that having said that when i you know i was a bit digging into it and i found that in fact even in ancient indian studies this is something which is a old uh, you know ayurveda uh, you know what we call maybe text i do not know whether it would be right to call it a text scripture or whatever and we see a kind of drawing where you can see anatomical features uh, which uh, you know which will almost obey what is the state of the art knowledge of modern anatomy and you clearly see if you zoom certain parts that you know what are the blood vessels and all the real impetus in this subject uh, came uh, so almost like around 1500s late 1500s or early 1600s it started and it started with a uh, very famous physician and uh, this is a subject where uh, almost all the early work was done either by a physician or by a mathematician uh, very you know not very commonly by engineers because engineering came into this subject much much later so uh, william harvey just uh, you know to summarize he was uh, the first one to really uh, give an explanation of the blood pumping in the human body and uh, the valves in the heart which will enable a unidirectional flow that was uh, first not only postulated but he also evidenced that uh, you know through some of his studies and historically his work is very very important in the context that what i am talking about today is because if at least in the scientific literature his works were the first to postulate the tiny capillaries between the arteries and veins so called micro capillaries or micro channels in human body and imagine you know an era this is like not the microfluidics era by any way so uh, you know then you know came the famous uh, you know scientist his law everybody has had to study to pass undergraduate fluid mechanics the poisson law so to say uh, the relationship between pressure drop and flow rate that you see in a laminar fully developed flow in a circular pipe or tube so again like he was simultaneously a physicist physician and uh, his objective was at the end uh, was to explain how blood is flowing through small capillaries but you know and 
in those days building up an experimental apparatus was not as trivial as it is currently so this is the you know uh, what i would call still a schematic of the apparatus that he built up in his own lab to study that and what we learn as a formula for uh, you know the fluid flow in such a narrow capillary is not exactly what he derived but what he studied from his these experiments finally you know that could be arrived at much later now his objective was to an extent satisfied because at least something was known to quantify the relationship between pressure drop and flow rate and why it is important if you go to a cardiac expert a cardiologist cardiologists talk about three lumped parameters they will talk about pressure flow and resistance just like as if there is an electrical circuit you have voltage current and resistance so whatever happens inside you know in the vasculature summarily for a cardiologist it is like a resistance and the way in which the resistance is correctly obtained is something that can take them to you know better way of understanding the clinical features but this was uh while this was a very important study but it was uh, only the beginning because it studied number 1 not blood as a complex fluid and number 2 not channels which are deformable this is a very very important thing in human body the blood vessels are deformable of course the deformability is something which is the primary thing but there are so many other aspects that are there with the deformability i will come to that but the primary aspect is they are flexible so otto frank in fact uh, you know you will see all these advancements major advancements happening every 100 years what you can say in the advancement of science so what he did is he he was the first to study the flow of blood in a say what i would call as a deformable uh, you know tube so to say and what he did is uh, he tried to use this as a model for explaining the compliance of the large blood vessels large you know the aorta the largest uh, you know artery so in that way and it was more or less like almost that electrical analogy model like a capacitance model like when it is uh, you know extending and compressing its ability to hold the blood is changing with time so as if it's a capacitance you know which is storing charge uh, you know that is being modeled now having uh, said all this uh, we can uh, very readily summarize certain aspects which make the vascular flows in human body so unique so i have mentioned that uh, you will have different dimensions of the blood vessel starting from say the largest one typically 2 point you know around 2 and 1/2 cm diameter smallest one microns uh, you know diameter so you will have wide range of reynolds number and wide range of reynolds number will not just mean reynolds number but it will mean a complete change in physics that uh, you know what is taking place you have unusual multiplicity or branching of the vessels these are not like straight channels that we talk about and they have their unusual wall properties why i say unusual is because it is very much different from material science so material science if you take a composition of a particular material and study its property it is universal right but in uh, this human body science you know even more or less the tissue composition remain in the same under certain physiological conditions their properties may be grossly different and that is why you know in modern day this personalized way of understanding disease is becoming very very important and people even doctors are asking these questions to themselves that why the same paracetamol 650 for everybody who has a fever although you know they have many different conditions unusual pulsatility will come from your pumping characteristics of individual blood a uh, heart and what uh, is also very important that complex rheology of blood and uh, the complex rheology of blood is it, it cannot just be simplified by telling that blood is a non newtonian fluid i mean it is 
it is somewhat much much deeper than that and uh, on the top of everything we have extreme personalized variations and very difficult to generalize these as a theory or a law so if you see summarily i know i will just touch upon one or two points and then we will see that how these points are leading to the research topic that i am uh, you know just going to browse through maybe today uh, a topic that we have been working on maybe for the last 6 7 years so if you see blood as a say uh, you know fluid the blood's complexity comes from the fact that the blood uh, has a watery component which we call as plasma but the blood has also the blood cells and you have the red blood cells white blood cells and platelets all these are functionally very very important but white blood cells and platelets are functionally important under certain challenging conditions for example in infection white blood cell becomes white blood cell becomes very critical when it comes to blood clotting issues or internal hemorrhage related matters platelet becomes very important but always important is red blood cells not just because uh, you know they are uh, you know the occupying the largest fraction of cells in the human body say about 85% but they are also having the highest volumetric percentage of the entire composition of blood and that is actually called as in the pathological jargon pcv packed cell volume or hematocrit which you see in the pathology reports if you do a complete blood count test so what is unique about the blood as a fluid when it is going when it is moving through a this microvascular passage is that uh, when blood is moving this if you see the red blood cells they are normally like blood bi biconcave discs but under extreme shear they will deform dramatically you know if they are going through a very narrow confinement see red blood cells will be typically what 7 8 microns in their end to end dimension and if you are forcing them through a constriction which is also maybe 10 micron or so they will be extremely sort of uh, aligned with that constriction almost like bullet shape it will form and because of its uh, elasticity of the membrane so these are all viscoelastic materials they have also viscous property and elastic property it will relax and you know come back to its uh, previous configuration when that uh, extreme deformation is released but when the extreme deformation is there because of this extreme deformation the red blood cell is subjected to a lift force at the wall and this lift force is stronger if you are having a micro capillary a very tiny capillary so this lift force pushes the red blood cells away from the wall whereas if you have a standard flow profile that will have a shear induced force that will try to push the blood red blood cell towards the wall at equilibrium the blood cells the red blood cells will stay a bit away from the wall and that means you have a cell free layer formed because of the cell free layer being formed the entire wall region which is supposed to be highly sort of resistive to blood flow that will now actually have less red blood cells so ironically if you make your micro channel narrower and narrower the effective viscosity of the blood which you expect to be more actually becomes less and this uh, subjectively was uh, found out as early as in 1930s by again two physicians who did not have of course a fluid mechanics explanation to that it is known as farheus lindquist effect and this of course in modern era with the advancement of computational fluid dynamics and so many you know other supportive techniques people have started uh, learning about this more and more now given that in in physiology all these things exist why should we try to engineer such a system that means uh, why should we make an attempt at all to make a system of this kind which is an artificially bio engineered system there are many many reasons i will give you one or two reasons for the interest of brevity <clears throat> all of us know about 
one of the important uh, you know, modern day uh, activities in drug research that is drug discovery. And if you see the drug discovery, you know, it has to go through some trials and these trials are typically lengthy processes. You will have first uh, some lab based development which we uh, typically would cover uh, like maybe close to 7 years including animal trials. And then once it passes through that stage, it goes through human trials again maybe another 7 years. Now, even these trials are challenged because uh, there are more and more ethical concerns of trialing with animals, humans. Even if you can do that, there is a huge gap between what how animals will behave in their physiological response and how humans will behave. And uh, that difference it is very difficult to nullify you know by this kind of uh, exercise. So, had it been possible to make an engineered system where if not fully replicating at least partly we can make such a system which is a which is almost like human physiologically mimicking system and make a trial of different say drug infusion or several other aspects even you know to understand the fundamentals of health and disease in physiology. You can tune with your parameters and you can do it freely, you can do it completely with invasion and uh, without any fear that you are interfering with a real practical system with full control that you can have. And if you have a success in this, then you can translate this success maybe to your drug you know entire drug discovery pathway. So, that a large part of lab research could be condensed to a smaller part before it is being put actually into trials. And this kind of in vitro studies uh, and even in silico studies simulations are progressively being recognized as substitutes to you know several other traditional studies. FDA has many medical devices now being approved almost you know completely through simulation based uh, you know, uh, validation. So, so many of these things are happening quite fast. In about 10 years back by recognizing the importance of this kind of say artificially engineered system, a research direction started blooming and it is known as organ on a chip and human body on a chip. Now, uh, of course, it does not literally mean that you are uh, making human organs on a small chip or maybe you are making a human body lying on a small chip not really like that. But what it all means is that you have replica of some of their organs through a collection of tissues and you have a connective network which is connecting all of them what you see in the green lines here. And even with the most modern research where this is I know if you if you just open literature and see organ on a chip and human body on a chip you will see it is perhaps the most active area of bioengineering research. But still you will see that it has not been able to make a kind of significant dent into you know having a clinical relevance. And there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is this you know these green lines they are still those engineered you know network connections these are not really even close to human body mimicking systems. So, what whatever is your platform where you are trialing maybe organs are having their functional mimicry, but the entire thing as a system does not have a structural and functional mimicry. And this is a motivation with which people have been doing a lot of research for the interest of time you know just to put it in the perspective of what we are doing currently with what others have reported currently. I am going to just very briefly browse through three papers which have come maybe in the last 6 months or so, where for the first time by 3D printing people have come to certain you know structures where it has been possible to mimic to a good extent the hierarchy of human blood vessels. And 
Uh, if you see summarily, I mean, I have given the references of this paper so that if you are interested, you can always go through the more details. But it is like a combination of bottom up and top down approach. It is neither a fully bottom up approach nor a fully top down approach. And in that way, what it does is first it, it prepares, say, the foundation, a bioprinted organ, and then it infuses certain uh, elements into it to give it more functionality like a human body. You know, system. That is what summarily what it is through a 3D printed system. And uh, so uh, this is you know, one of the papers which was perhaps the first one uh, to give a direct route of hierarchical blood vessels uh, you know, engineering via 3D bioprinting. And if you see uh, a very recent science paper, it is just uh, you know, a few maybe days back or uh, month back that uh, using uh, silicone based fluid liquid of very low interfacial tension uh, this research group could generate structures which are, and with functions which would uh, you know mimic largely the brain aneurysm models what what you could get you know very very important to understand the cerebral stroke and other events but uh, when we started our works related to this in our research group our objective was twofold one is of course, to understand what are uh, you know, the features of these kinds of systems versus the traditional microchannel based systems, but also how in a country like India, where we do not have that you know, very high end labs and machines everywhere around, all institutes are not as blessed as this institute where I am you know, uh, privileged to give a talk today. So, how people will take up activities where they can actually with a very frugal way can try to what I would say emulate some of the aspects that we find very emphatically in a microvasculature in human body. The first point with which we started is like making a deformable micro channel and what we did is something uh, you know it, it is it is a method which does not require a clean room. So, the method we adopted is like you have a petri dish and in that petri dish you and this is a standard petri dish that anybody will use in a life science lab and this is a standard lumbar puncture needle which you will get in most of the medical centers very commonly and this has an outer diameter of about 250 micron. So, what you do is that you pour a gel like material in fact it's a gelatin uh, material and uh, one of the motivations of using this is it is a derivative of collagen which is a protein abundantly found in human tissues and it is possible to tune its properties and i will show that how it is possible but at least this you know elastic modulus wise it is it is quite uh, conforming to many of the human tissue systems so we made a mold out of this and once we somehow force this needle out of this petri dish a hollow space with this material could be created and uh, perhaps the you know, simplest way of making this micro channel. This work was done by a PhD student jointly working with me and Professor Sunando Dasgupta in the chemical engineering department his name is Kiran and currently he is an assistant professor at IIT Madras. So, what uh, then we did is of course, our objective was to uh, first build up from a rigid micro channel to a deformable micro channel, but gradually moving towards human body uh, you know not really mimicking, but closer and closer to human body micro channels. But even in this channel what we first started to see is that how the red blood cells collectively move into this as compared to uh, say what they would do in a rigid channel. So, we made a standard microfluidic setup here and uh, used a solution of red blood cells uh, with certain dilution because to visualize it you will require a bit of dilution you, you cannot do use of that high concentration as it is there in the normal blood. So, we use summarily particle tracking velocimetry that you track this individual red blood cells as they are moving in the fluid and to 
construct the velocity field within the blood as a fluid, you use the micro PIV, uh, micro particle image velocimetry, and use them together and use the standard microscopic to see the deform deformation of the micro channel. And uh, once we put all this up together, we found out one very interesting observation. See, the red blood cells, as I told you, that they are quite deformable. And once they are deforming, there are two major types of motion that they pass through. One is called as a tumbling motion, you know, which is uh, at low shear that they will have. And the other is a tank treading motion, which they will have at bit of high shear. So, the, the first one is more like a you know, rotation with respect to uh, you know, certain axis. And the second one is more like elongation in a certain direction because of the shear. So, the tumbling motion will normally endure high drag force and therefore, it is very important to you know for it to have uh, in the physiological system. And for the first time what we found is how this tumbling to tank trading transition could be influenced by a deformable uh, micro channel uh, by altering the shear locally. How the shear alters locally I will come into that uh, subsequently. But to take into the journey forward, we then learned how to uh, say control flow of blood in such a micro channel where the deformation of the micro channel we can control that much. But that is far, far away from what happens in the human body. So, one of the complexities as I mentioned in one of my early slides is that you have a complex network of blood vessels, not like a straight channel. So, the question is can we make a, a complex microvascular network type of thing which very importantly both structurally and functionally behave like what is there in a blood vessel. Combination of this is the whole challenge like once you make it structurally you, you find that your structural way of making it makes it functionally you know deviated from the biology part. And functionally, if you want to do it like a biology lab, you see structurally it is not a stable structure. So, what we try to do is we try to actually put forward two different uh, ways of again making a very frugal uh, you know, way of uh, fabricating these channels, not like you know, use of a very high end 3D printer to do this. So, what we did is First we, uh, no, first we were bothered so much about this you know, uh, what I would call as this uh, branched network pattern. And we found that actually this is the law of nature that many of the branching structures in some of the leaves will have a similarity of the branching structure that we have in several other systems including the physiological systems. And there are many common laws which govern for example, there is something called as Murray's law and what it is you know if those of you who can simply recognize conservation of mass see this is cube you know some of the cubes of the daughter branches is equal to you know some of the cubes of the parent branches and it is basically volume in equal to volume out conservation of you know say flow rate you can say so i know nature makes things in that way so we what we tried to do is we tried to make a soft lithography process where we tried to replicate these structures but once we did this uh, you know, microscopy, what we found that you know, we were a bit disappointed. And uh, the disappointment came because the inner lumen of this one after our fabrication, we found that it is almost like a trapezoidal shape. Whereas in human body lumen, it is not perfectly circle, but it will be more like towards circular rather than trapezoidal. So we've, uh, you know, we found that we had to do something different and uh, this work was uh, this part of the work was done by uh, my former PhD student uh, Josna uh, in collaboration with Professor Somen Das from the School of Medical Science and Technology IIT Kharagpur. So, we were uh, working on the fabrication of this and uh, what uh, came out of our brainstorming is that let us keep this structure, but instead of this leaf we make our own pattern. So, what we did is we created a hydrogel wire structure like this. And then 
molded PDMS on the top of the hydrogel structure and flushed away the hydrogel structure you know, through a pressurized flow. And that is how we could create a hollow network of the choice that we could do. Now, we make the hollow network that is step one, but as an engineering step it is fine, but as a bioengineering it is nothing. So, the functionalization of that is very, very critical. So, one of the most critical things, there are so many critical things, one of the most critical things is that this microvascular network at their wall, these blood vessels will have a type of cell known as endothelial cell. And endothelial cells are what I would say the engines of the functionality of these blood vessels. And this endothelial cell layer somehow has to be mimicked. It is not so easy because you know if you see the entire you know biomechanics and mechanotransduction within the endothelial cell layer, you have so many proteins. You have a very special protein known as glycocalyx protein, which has which brings in charge also to the endothelial layer and it, it drives the blood flow completely in a different way. So, what we try to do is to develop a protocol which will tell us that how this endothelial cells could be layered within this microvascular network. We could optimize this protocol for the interest of time. I am not going through this, but you know, this is a 2021 paper from our group. You can you know, read all the protocol which is there in the supplementary information of this paper. So, once we uh, you know made this uh, sort of stable and stability of this is very important because as you are passing blood flow, whatever you saw stable in a static condition, under dynamic condition it may be completely flushed away. So, you have to stabilize it and how stable it is actually we started to look into another very important aspect that is the dynamics of circulatory tumor cells. Circulatory tumor cells or CTCs are such cells which are shed in the bloodstream when the cancer is progressing say from one uh, stage to another. Typically, you will see a significant concentration of this when you are at a progressive later stage cancer and therefore, it is not so good so far as an early stage cancer diagnostic. But the advantage of this is that it is a simple blood test by which you can detect cancer you know, rather than doing a biopsy you know, invasive procedure. So, we started looking into the dynamics of the circulatory tumor cells and how they are interacting with the endothelial cells. And to do that, we tag this with certain dyes and you can see the classical the fluorophore and the other dyes being used to visualize the cell cell tight junction of the endothelial layer shows that the endothelial cells are very stable and their nucleus also you can see this you know blue colored thing and the molecules which are binding the different endothelial you know cell lines you can see them as blue dots here of course the resolution is not so good in a presentation but you know in a higher resolution figure you will be able to see that so to an extent we could have a structure which structurally and functionally is able to represent the flow of say uh, blood as a fluid in an engineering device. Now, I started with the aspect of say drug uh, you know sort of responsiveness to the drug delivery and all and therefore, towards the end of my presentation where I have come to, I am coming to an example where we have tried to see that how can we use this as a platform to study the efficacy of targeted drug delivery by magnetic nanoparticles. Now, nowadays in cancer uh, you know therapy targeted drug delivery has become very, very important and uh, a common sense reason that we all know that whatever may be the therapy used for the cancer many times it cures the disease so to say, but also in a loose term it induces its own side effects and the side effects are because of the damage of even the healthy cells which are parts of our immune system and then you know that uh, people who are recovering from cancer you will see that they are in certain you know suddenly they are uh, having some other forms of illness. So, what we tried to see is that uh, this again was a uh, ex existing technology, but this technology was not so successful in say having a targeted drug delivery to the 
cancer tumor site and this technology is that you have magnetic nanoparticles you put you know you tag them with the drug molecules use a magnetic field transverse to the channel where the blood is flowing and the magnetic nanoparticle will get towards the wall and if they are captured they can be targeted towards the site the specific site where you want to push the drug now this being a principle and this being well known uh, as a principle there has been a huge gap between uh, how in principle it is and how effective it is and you will find that till now this technology for targeted drug delivery is not at all common in any clinical setup it is still there in the research setup mostly so what we tried to do is to develop a setup where we use this gel type of you know material this uh, what i uh, mentioned for making the straight micro channel the same material but uh, you know we are uh, sort of uh, adding another material known as agarose with some percentage to make it you know basically bonded together well and also biocompatible so many other properties it will get which is not just possible with a gelatin as a material so with that uh, we created some tissue phantoms again not by a 3d printing route but the frugal approach that i have just pointed out so we made this structure and uh, this work was done by uh, dr shoma bhattacharya who was a post doctoral fellow in our research group and uh, we worked on this jointly with uh, professor ranjan ganguli from jadavpur university who who was the phd supervisor of shomo before he joined uh, our research group currently shomo is working in the achira diagnostics uh, at uh, bangalore itself so uh, what uh, uh, we did as a part of uh, you know this work is that uh, we tried to see you know take take away the drug part but consider try to see it as a mechanics problem so you have a deformable system you have blood being pushed so we actually studied it in two steps one is using a blood analog as a fluid you know there are many uh, in this audience and i believe some are from engineering as as a student of engineering when i first entered into this area the greatest inhibition for me at least was to even imagine that i have to work with blood forget about you know handling a blood sample and uh, so you know for those who have that phobia for working with blood i will give you a simple remedy use a fluid known as xanthan gum so xanthan gum is a fluid which except the cells of blood has almost 100% property rheological property of blood it is a shear thinning fluid exactly how uh, you know blood will behave so with that xanthan gum and we use some iron oxide nanoparticles which uh, you know are simulators of that drug carrier and to you know cut the story short what we tried to do is to see that if we have such a deformable wall how the particles are being captured the entire success of your magnetic nanoparticle targeting to the this tumor site is how much of it is captured versus washed away with the blood stream and what we found is that that fractional capturing efficiency has a lot to do with the deformation of the this channel walls so for example what you see is that the channel wall before the flow was something like this so when the flow is taking place somewhere it is deeply bulging you know into and somewhere it is you know getting more inner because its mass has to be conserved i mean it it somewhere where it is more bulged somewhere it has to be less and wherever it is more bulged it is almost like engulfing the particle <coughs> and the particle and you have to imagine there is a transverse magnetic field so when the channel has engulfed the particle it is no uh, i mean the particle is no more under the viscous resistance of the fluid flow and the transverse magnetic field will pull it towards the wall and because of the particular chain like structure of these nanoparticles locally the pressure that is built up because of this typically will be about say <clears throat> i mean uh, 100 times the atmospheric pressure and uh, whereas you require only about 
say of the order of 10 times of the atmospheric pressure to rupture the wall and make the particle penetrate into that uh, you know, tumor site. So, if this could be you know programmed carefully or if this could be taken into account carefully, one can use this as a setup to understand how effective the targeted drug delivery is, which currently is completely missing. People are just using experience and looking into that. Now, finally, with all these, I am coming to the final point, which again I am coming to you know the last, uh, but you know the, the most emphatic point that I talked about is that all these blood vessel mimics that we, we fabricated, those are static structures. But I talked about a phenomenon called as angiogenesis. So, in angiogenesis what happens is that uh, now I am trying to give you a sort of very simplistic viewpoint and here the advantage that I have is that I also do not understand much beyond the simplistic thing. So, it will be synchronized with those who do not understand biology much. So, when you have this healthy blood vessel, you have these endothelial cells. I was just talking about the endothelial cells, you can see they are. Now, here say there is a tumor which is growing and when a tumor is growing, the tumor for its growth will require special nutritional support because its growth is uh, you know at quite a vigorous uh, you know rate. So, it should get its own support system, may be oxygen, may be nut nutrients and so on. So, it will try to have its own blood vessels connecting it. So, how it naturally does is that it releases certain what you call as chemical factors called as growth factors. And growth factor the name will you know it is almost related to like it is related to the advancement of you know what is going on. So, this growth factor will have a high concentration here and zero concentration here. The blood vessel does not yet understand that this tumor is there. Now, just like a concentration gradient induces diffusion, here also there is a diffusion that means a message goes to the blood vessel that well there is a growth factor gradient and the blood vessel in response to that releases endothelial cells. And the endothelial cells they will proliferate and form like a S type of structure which will merge at the end and dynamically create blood vessel which will uh, you know uh, converge to this tumor. And that is how a connectivity between the primary tumor and the blood vessel will come by which it will go into a secondary stream and metastasis will take place. So, that you know the primary cancer at some place may be affecting at, la at later time some other organ may be affected by cancer. So, it is of course, a very complex phenomenon. So, what we did is we tried to uh, abstract this concept through a conceptual model where this uh, extracellular matrix we try to you know model it as a porous medium with you know this hydrogel like structure which is very much similar to the bioengineered material and in the previous study uh, you know i did not talk about the properties of all these materials but we try to use the composition in a way that it mimic the colorectal uh, you know uh, tumor properties uh, so that means if studied successfully it could give you an indication of how maybe a targeted drug delivery will impact a colon cancer treatment or you know, colorectal cancer treatment. So, we tried to use such a you know uh, sort of uh, just go back maybe sorry. sorry. So, we tried to have uh, uh, this kind of a gel structure and two micro channels one having a high concentration of the growth factor and another zero concentration of the growth factor. And we wanted to see how the endothelial cells would finally get distributed because of that. So, uh, you know there are certain phenomena which, which we tried to account for and these are actually getting in more and more complex and that is why I have put it at the end. So, one is that uh, when you have a gradient, uh, when you have a concentration gradient you have diffusion. So, similarly when you have uh, some attractant chemicals like the growth factor, there will be a migration of cells uh, as per that and this is known as chemotaxis. So, this is one phenomenon. Now, you also have 
the same kind of thing chemotaxis is a bulk phenomenon but you also have it along the surface of the your fluidic network on the surface that is known as haptotaxis and you also have the natural you know mitosis like the cell division going on so cumulatively your functional system which you are you know attempting to make should be able to represent all these and uh, in principle uh, you know quite trivial but not so easy so what we tried to do is of course to develop a bit of mathematical understanding of you know the concentration variation as a function of the chemotaxis the haptotaxis the binding or degradation and also the random motility of these all these things because these are natural systems like they will have their you know random motility and uh, so with that we tried to develop a species concentration model which we tried to combine with what you say as fluid flow model which is the flow in the microfluidic system as well as the hydrogel cage network in the process we try to uh, consider all the chemotactic factors for a tumor growth all the haptotactic factors and in that way try to see that if you have a cage like structure maybe an ellipsoid cage like structure of that extracellular matrix how the endothelial cells will get distributed around that why it is very important is because if you get such a snapshots the natural way forward will be try to mimic these snapshots in a dynamical framework as you are making microfluidic systems which will dynamically grow not that we have come to that stage but always you know whenever i talk even when i uh, discuss something with my students uh, my natural approach is of course we all talk about what we could do but more importantly we talk about what we could not do and you know this is such a thing which is perhaps the hardest problems to crack in this area that you have a static system we know how to make the static system with certain level of similitude to what is there in the human body but how can you make it dynamically adaptive by considering the functionality what is there in the human body so we are far away from that but uh, there is actually one paper which is there as a in vitro angiogenesis but this is a classical biology paper it was reported in nature protocol several years back but that is how this subject is this is considered to be a subject more like for biologists now the challenge for bioengineers can be that can we convert this protocol to the fabrication of an engineered device which we call as angiogenesis model on a chip that is not just the static framework but the dynamic framework currently we are far far away from this but who knows that you know the the people who are working on these topics at some point of time they will crack this and really you know be able to understand what is functionally happening during the angiogenesis process and that i think will be the real clue to understanding the cancer progression and uh, perhaps the biggest breakthrough that a bioengineering research in this direction is looking forward to i would like to summarize the main points uh, of this what i talked about that physiological flows are of course very complex it is not completely possible to <coughs> model such a physiological system even if you are thinking numerical modeling or making an experimental setup but one can move step by step forward come to a stage where there are in vitro systems not very complex to fabricate but one can study a whole lot of you know functional aspects of human body health and disease connect that with the state of the art organ on a chip or human body on a chip system to make the next generation technology what we may call as biomimetic human body on a chip and closer and closer to that we can go it will be possible for clinicians to have models of that and look into human bodies as personalized you know dynamical entities rather than having a general model for everybody and with that and simulation and advancement of data science where all these data can be cumulated in the form of say training information can get into neural network or you know any any other kind of deep learning uh, 
uh, you know, methods to come up with something which can ultimately help the clinicians. The objective of bioengineering is not just to do uh, scholastic or academic research, but perhaps to do something which can help clinicians to understand the clues of various diseases, which till now remains to be a mystery. Of course, I would like to thank everybody who has supported uh, you know, these kinds of researches, but particularly the students, my faculty colleagues, and uh, the funding agencies whom I have not separately mentioned here, uh, our institute, authorities, uh, with whose support uh, whatever we could do up to this now I presented. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Suman, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, there's a microphone. Uh, <coughs> Hello, sir. A really interesting talk. One aspect perhaps I don't think you have mentioned is the pulsatile flow uh, the blood actually has inside the body and the frequency at which I it happens. I will give you an answer to this. Uh, now, there is a very specific pinpointed answer. I was talking about microvasculature. The pulsatile flow is important for large blood vessels, large arteries and large veins. The pulsatility of flow is of secondary importance for microvasculature. That is why you know this uh, has not been taken into but you know there is a different you know, part of the work in our research group where we work on this large artery typically the carotid artery which is very important for cardiovascular system you are correct and that is where the pulsatile nature of the flow is very very critical yeah hi okay. um, so i have a question about the drug delivery um, aspect that you are talking about so one thing that was not clear to me is where that deformation is happening, whether you have any control or not. Because if there is a tumor, I would expect that you have to do it in a very controlled manner. So I was wondering if you can comment on that. Well, um, you know, controlling is uh, difficult in a way that, uh, first of all, if you see the architecture of the wall of a blood vessel, the architecture of a wall of a blood vessel will have certain uh, you know, features which are very difficult to put in a first level study of engineering. But the way in which it can be controlled is that uh, if you have a flow direction, if you have a transverse magnetic field, so flow direction will have a say an axial movement and it is defined by say a Reynolds number of flow for example. And you have a strength of the transverse magnetic field and for which you know you are applying an external field so typically it will be of the order of some 10 of tens of tesla per meter something like that so uh, if you have such a field then you can use that order of magnitude to actually know that let us say you have an angiogram of your you know this thing blood vessel so you will know that given that uh, you know that flow is occurring where it will be more bulging and where it will be less bulging so, wherever it is more bulging, it is actually engulfing the particle. So, if you can somehow, you know, maybe locally have your magnetic field such that the magnetic field is a bit stronger there, then what it will do is that it will perhaps override everything else what is happening at other places, but wherever it is bulging more, it will capture the particles and release it. Because if it is captured, we have seen that with uh, you know, that force it which it captures, it develops enough of penetration to you know, penetrate the wall of the blood vessel. So, it is all about you know, mechanistically knowing or having a control on your uh, you know, targeted uh, you know, this what you say nanoparticle delivery spot at the bulging locations. Yeah, yeah. So your your you know the the location where you release this in your stream. If you, for example, say imagine that doctor is having a procedure, so doctor will have a visualization of where it is bulging. Yeah, and so if 
it can be computer controlled in a way that your particle release it at that place, then you know this technique will ensure that it, it, it will be captured more effectively. That is what mechanistically it says. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, maybe over there. Uh, Uh, hello, sir. Uh, very exciting and nice talk. So, I have one question. In your uh, biomimetic system, if you are if you are using the endothelial cells, so there would also be a system to maintain the health of the endothelial cells. That how you will maintain the endothelial cells system. And the second question is that. Now, in to today, in, in many labs, people are making synthetic cells, the mimetic cells. So, instead of using synthetic, uh, the endothelial cells, what if you can use the the synthetic cells instead of the natural cells? So, that will be more. Yeah, the both both of these are very very important uh, points. So, first of all, the stabilization of the endothelial cell against the flow is. Uh, no, using the same protocol what we use for microfluidic cell culture systems. The advantage that uh, you know, we have in many of these studies is that the time scale over which the experiment is being done is not very long. So, it, if it is even if it is metastable it is good enough and most of the current cell culture microfluidic platforms are uh, you know, assuring that. Coming to the second point, uh, well whether synthetic endothelial cells will be able to mimic uh, you know the actual endothelial cells it uh, so if you see you know again i have to give an answer only mechanistically so mechanics wise endothelial cell has two important properties you know people who work on mechanics use that one is it is considered to be like a poroelastic layer so it's a porous medium with certain elasticity so whether the poroelastic behavior of a real endothelial cell layer and the poroelastic behavior of that one what you are talking about is having a similitude is a question that is number one. The second is the endothelial cells have a very important and a few important proteins, but one of the most important proteins is known as a glycocalyx protein. And this protein is very important because it has a surface charge. And if you see the you know cells, red blood cells, they will also have a charge around. So it will be like an electrostatic uh, you know interaction between them, and almost like as if you know those of you who are familiar with the concept of electrical double layer in microfluidics, as if an electrical double layer is there on the blood vessel. So whether that aspect is being mimicked also by this artificial material. So if these two are yes, then mechanistically yes. But biologically, you know, in one of the slides that I showed, that there are lots of other, uh, you know, entities in the endothelial cell. They uh, participate in the mechanobiological events. Now, whether they are of primary importance or not is something that has to be isolated. When you are using a real endothelial cell, you don't care about that because that is what you are using. When you are using a mimic one you have to see what are the primary effects and what are the secondary effects. But the two primary effects are that I talked about, at least from a mechanics point of view, these have to be assured. I am not aware of this particular material that you are talking about. So, I cannot give a specific answer, but I can tell you what are the pointers that you know, one should look into. Okay. Um, so, I think in the interest of time, uh, we should stop here. But before we close the session, a uh, couple of announcements. Before that, let me first thank Infosys Science Foundation for uh, making all the arrangements for this lecture. Um, I'm told by Alok, uh, who is a faculty in mechanical engineering, that there is a special interaction session with Suman at 7 p.m. in mechanical engineering department, uh, I believe in the seminar hall. So please make the best use of it. Uh, you can continue the question and answer session during that uh, interaction at 7 p.m. And I understand there's also a coffee tea arrangement. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about that. We will figure that out uh, when we step out. Uh, and if we do have that, uh, I think we will continue the discussion uh, uh, you know, uh, after this formal session. 
So with that, uh, let's thank uh, Suman again for a wonderful talk. Uh, thank you.